we're going to put the long-term bonds in, and we're going to see if that helps us fix more things in the economy, make it more efficient or not, and how we do it if uh, it does help us. But I want to start with uh, a bit of data, so something that I guess you rarely see in this workshop, but I promise uh, I won't show you anything more empirical after this slide. But uh, on the top, I'm putting the reserves that are issued by the Fed and held by various depository institutions in the US. And at the bottom, I show you the interest rate that the Fed pays on these reserves. And there are two striking things, which are probably well known, but I would say striking nevertheless. The first one is that the reserves have really exploded over the last 15 years. So uh, before the great financial crisis, you see this flat line that looks like zero, but it's not actually zero. It's about $40 billion uh, worth of reserves. But uh, this is completely dwarfed by, by whatever follows after the, uh, the crisis. So here, the QE starts. So what the Fed starts to do is expand its balance sheet, issue more reserves, and absorb uh, various assets that are held in the economy by intermediaries. And then it, uh, this expansion continues sort of slows down, reverts a bit, and there's another spike during COVID, and uh, now we end up with uh, about four trillion worth of uh, reserves, and uh, compared to what used to be there before the great financial crisis, it's about 100 times increased. Uh, looking at the interest rate that the Fed is now paying on these reserves, you see sort of a similar trend in the sense that, again, before the financial crisis, the Fed was not paying any interest on its reserves, and then it started to pay this interest, but then for a long time, the interest rate was almost zero. So the economy was at the zero lower bound in this period. Then it started, there was a bit of tightening going on before the COVID, but once the COVID had arrived, there was another uh, loosening, the, rate, the rates went back to zero, stayed there for a couple of years. And only now we see this sort of, in some sense, recovery to conducting the monetary policy in a more standard usual way, away from the zero roll bound, we see this tightening, we can think about interest rates going up or down. But what I wanna, the point that I wanna make is that this tightening that we see here nowadays is very different from all the tightenings that had happened previously from the perspective of the central bank. Because the way the monetary policy was conducted before the great financial crisis was that the central bank could just uh, do some open market operations, somehow tweak the Fed funds rate on the interbank market, and that would cost virtually zero for the central bank. That would be very small interventions that would be financially uh, not costly. But now, this new tightening, this re most recent tightening, means that all this interest that the Fed is setting on its reserves has to be paid on an enormous amount of reserves. That is due to the, all the QE policy, all the balance sheet expansion policy that had been done over the last 15 years. So from the perspective of central bank, this tightening is not like all the other tightenings that it had done previously. And uh, just to put it into some numbers, if you look at the interest rate payments that the Fed had to pay uh, at, uh, let's say, 2010, so already when the QE started, already with a lot of balance sheet expansion and already a lot of reserves in the system, still, as percent of GDP, it was about two basis points, so less than, less than two hundredths of a percent. And uh, nowadays, it's about 0.7% of GDP, what the Fed has to pay as interest payments on reserves. And if you think about other government spending categories, like healthcare or, or defense, uh, they are on the verge of three, four percent of GDP. So this is like a quarter of all the spending on, let's say, Medicare, which is a uh, really huge numbers. So what I think it does, it, it raises, of course, a few questions, some of which I, I list on this slide, um, and uh, probably many more others. For example, how, do, how should the central bank conduct interest rate policy after this long period of QE? So should the central bank reevaluate the way it sets these interest rates, given all this big amount of reserves that it had issued over the last 15 years, or should the monetary policy just be conducted in the exact same way and, and nothing needs to be adjusted. Uh, how does the balance sheet policy interact with interest rate policy? So when the, when the, the central bank decides on balance sheet expansions or contractions and the conventional interest rate monetary policy, should it do it independently, maybe setting different targets for each of its policy instruments, or should these two policies be studied and analyzed jointly? Because there could be some interactions between the two and maybe one affecting the transmission of the other. 
And finally, what is the optimal size of the central bank balance sheet? How much QE or QT do we want to conduct and how should we manage it actively? And uh, today I'm not going to answer all of these questions, but uh, the goal for today is just to set up a framework that of course is going to be based on all the other frameworks and models that we have seen uh, over the last two days to hopefully study these questions and gain some insights in a structural way in a model. And uh, the framework that I'm going to use is going to borrow small different details, different blocks for almost all the talks that we had seen previously. So there's going to be something from Marcus's talk, something from Magnus, something from Sebastian, and something from Yuli. So now that you're completely familiar with all those frameworks and mastered them all, this is going to be very easy for you. Um, the, just you know, to give you a brief takeaways, that of course we're going to dive much deeper during the talk, uh, what did we learn? We learned that QE, so the balance sheet policy, works as a mediator of the interest rate policy. So the way QE works is basically the job of the QE is to bring the economy in some sense in the right position, such that when the shock arrives and the conventional monetary policy kicks in, the response of the economy is efficient, in some sense that we're going to define later. And uh, the way QE moderates this interest rate policy is that if you have expanded your balance sheet a lot, if you had done a lot of QE previously, you put yourself in the position when you need to conduct the conventional interest rate policy much more aggressively going forward. So the QE that you had done in the past affects how you should set the interest rates going forward. Uh, and in some sense, this very large central bank balance sheet makes the interest rate policy less effective and that's why you have to be more aggressive to achieve the same target. All right, so uh, let me start with uh, the framework and I'm, I, I will give you kind of a brief overview of the main components and the main mechanisms and then we will go into the details and, and, and the math. Um, so this is going to be a two sector model. There are going to be households which are going to be rather standard in the sense they will be holding capital, producing output, and they will be subject to idiosyncratic risk, so something that you have already seen many times. And then there are going to be intermediaries, which you could think of also experts, but the reason why I call them intermediaries is because they're not going to be there to produce output more efficiently, but their job would be in diversifying away this idiosyncratic risk. So I think of some kind of financial intermediation technology that allows you to, to diversify the individual risks of, of, of all the households once you collect them and put them together. Um, that would be the government. That would be, in some sense, the main uh, uh, new element in this model because there will be a lot of different policies that we will introduce with many details. The government will be levying some taxes and conducting both the interest rate and the balance sheet policy. Uh, and finally, everything that the, the model setup that I show you today is completely cast in the flex price framework and uh, if time permits, in the very end, we can very quickly go into the sticky price extension and see what kind of trade-offs uh, it introduces and what things are, are different or the same. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, going to slightly more details, uh, describing what the agents do, how they behave. So we have households that uh, hold capital KT, and they produce a KT of output per unit of time. The capital involves in this familiar way. They can invest into capital. They choose the investment grade IOTA. Uh, and then they're subject to this idiosyncratic risk. So again, there's a separate shock for everybody in the room. But uh, this volatility loading, this sigma tilde D is common for everyone. At the point, th there's no aggregate risk. Um, and this idiosyncratic risk volatility sigma tilde is going to be time varying. And in particular, it's going to be mean reverting. So that means that. If today your sigma tilde t is above the steady state value, then this term here is positive and you get a negative drift. So if you're above the steady state, you get a negative drift, you go back to the steady state, that's mean reversion. As you can see, there is no risk here. There's no Brownian motion, no jumps. I, I don't put it in, but I still write it as a time varying. So in that sense, this is going to be evolving deterministically. So uh, you could say, well, let's just put it at the steady state because we know in finite time, well, not only finite time, we know that it's going to reach the steady state and uh, then we can just think of the steady state economy. But later on, we will put a shock inside the system. It's going to be an unanticipated shock following which the system is going to go back to the steady state. 
So already now it's good to think about this sigma tilde t as moving over time. Um, and uh, of course the households, they're going to be risk averse. They're not going to like this idiosyncratic risk and they would be happy to, to offload this risk as much as possible, get, a, get rid of this risk. And they will have this opportunity to issue outside equity to the intermediaries. So they would be able to offload their risk, at least part of it, to the intermediaries who are going to be better at managing this risk. Um, so how they're going to do it, the intermediaries, they're not going to hold any capital. They will be completely unproductive in that sense, but they will have this risk diversification technology. What it means is that when an intermediary buys an outside equity from the household that carries this risk sigma tilde t, the intermediary itself is not subject to all of that risk, but only to a fraction of it, which I don't know by verify. So essentially, if the household offloads one unit of risk, the intermediary puts effectively only verify units of that risk onto its balance sheet. Um, the intermediaries also issue safe deposits to households and lever up. So the intermediaries are going to be leveraged. They're going to be uh, exposed to some additional risk through this leverage. They will also hold reserves and long-term government bonds. And this is going to be the main policy rules. Yeah. That is exogenous. So that is just a parameter how much risk you diversify. Or uh, better to say, how much risk you keep. So the, the smaller is the var theta, the more you diversify, and the smaller is the risk that you end up being subject to. OK. So uh, the government, we will be thinking for most of the time of the consolidated government budget constraint. But just to, to label, to put some names, we're going to think about the fiscal side of the government and the monetary side of the government. And the fiscal side of the government is going to be issuing these long-term bonds. These are going to be perpetual bonds. They never mature. And they pay you indefinitely this nominal interest rate IL, which is going to be constant over time. And the government can also raise some taxes the same way that it was doing in, in the models, for example, that, that Sebastian presented earlier. Uh, the monetary side is going to be uh, more, uh, more intricate. So first of all, they will be issuing reserves that I denote by RT. And they also set reserves requirements, theta lower bar R. So what it means is that, remember, thetas are always the portfolio shares that agents allocate to different assets. And this puts a lower bound on the portfolio share that intermediaries can allocate to reserves. So they can hold more reserves than this, but they cannot hold less. And this is a policy rule that is managed by the central bank. That's the reserve requirement. Uh, the central bank is going to set the interest rates on both required and excess reserves. So in case you only hold what you're required to hold, you get this interest rate I lower bar. In case you decide to, form, to hold more than that, then that part that, part that, that is in excess, we're going to call the excess reserves. And these excess reserves are going to earn you another interest IT. So the central bank is going to manage two interest rates instead of just one. Finally, there's going to be this balance sheet policy. Uh, I'm going to have a picture for it later, but I think it probably is already clear now. The idea is that you expand your balance sheet as the central bank, you issue more reserves, you observe the long-term bonds from the economy, and that way you affect the long-term bond to reserve ratio in the economy. That's how you can think of the balance sheet policy. All right. So uh, that's uh, a stylized picture of the balance sheets of, in this economy. So we have the households that hold the capital that is, carries this idiosyncratic risk. They hold the safe deposits that are issued by the intermediaries. They have some of their own net worth. And part of this risk that, is, that sits in their capital, they can offload through issuing outside equity. So the outside equity appears on the liability side. That's the risk that they pass on to the intermediary. Now the intermediaries hold this outside equity. Um, they diversify risk. They issue deposits. They have net worth. And then they hold these two um, versions of nominal debt that is issued by the government, the short-term reserves and the long-term bonds. And then we have a sort of slightly stylized balance sheet for the central bank in which you have bonds on the asset side and liabilities, uh, I'm sorry, and the reserves on the liability side. So, what does QE do? Essentially, if you start from this balance sheet composition and then you do, uh, let me just finish this, you do QE, then 
you are expanding your central bank balance sheet. So it means that you issue more reserves and then you buy the long-term bonds from the intermediaries. So the intermediaries balance sheet, again, you see the same expansion and reserves and you get the corresponding reduction in the long-term bond holdings. If you want to do QT or if you do QT, then you ju just revert that. You do the opposite, you shrink the balance sheet. Yeah. No, the L, this L is the one that is held by the intermediaries. That's the one that is there in the economy. They're not in the notation, that's right. There's a, yes, there's a shadow value of that <laughs> that I don't define explicitly. All right, um, any questions so far on, on the high level description of the model? Yes, that's the assumption, that's the constraint for now. The, uh, uh, essentially, only the intermediaries hold these long-term bonds. That's right. Right, that, that's a good question. So why is, uh, why is this phi not zero? You could make the phi zero, but then it becomes a very boring economy because then intermediaries can absorb all the risk because it doesn't cost them anything. And then you end up with an economy that is completely deterministic. There's no idiosyncratic risk, there's nothing. And intermediaries basically just take over the economy because they earn this, this risk premium. They, 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 earn the, they can earn on this ability to diversify. And uh, that's not an interesting economy to study. So uh, th that's a good point. So wh whether how realistic this is, I would say that it's not completely unrealistic because I would argue that the intermediaries in the real world are still subject to some idiosyncratic shocks. Whether it comes purely from the portfolio composition of their outside equity counterpart for what you have in the model or not, that's a di more difficult question. But I don't think it's crazy to assume that not all, not all the financial sector moves exactly in sync. Um, yes. This phi is the same for everybody, yes. There are no intermediaries that are better, yes, they're the same. Within the sectors, within the two sectors, everybody is the same up to the, this Brownian shock that you get that is idiosyncratic. Yes. That's a very good question. So can I kind of get rid of one or let's say fix one and then play with the other. Uh, we haven't derived it yet. We haven't kind of proved it, this equivalence, but we have a feeling that it probably is equivalent. So you could, uh, uh, maybe let me defer it to, to a later point where I show you how exactly they set these things, how the central bank set these things, and then maybe I'll, I'll come back to it uh, because I think it's a, it's a good point. Okay, so uh, let's go into the math now. So this is the problem of the households. So they're going to have log utility to make things simpler. And uh, their, their problem is going to be very similar to the kind of problems you have seen so far. So they will be consuming something out of their net worth. Uh, they're going to be getting some return on their net worth, which is going to consist of return on deposits that they get from the intermediaries. Uh, they're going to allocate some fraction of their portfolio into capital and then get the excess return uh, relative to deposits. And the new part is going to be they can also issue this outside equity. And the way I model it is through this chi uh, choice variable, which essentially tells you how much, what is the fraction of their capital risk that they offload to the intermediaries. So they decide how much capital to hold overall and how much outside equity to issue as a fraction of their total capital uh, portfolio share. Uh, it's just going to be, a, it, it's a more convenient variable to think about and to carry uh, over into the, the uh, general equilibrium. So how the returns are going to look like, the return on deposits, deposits are safe. Uh, it's going, there's going to be some, some expected return and that's it. This is of course determined in equilibrium. The return on capital again should be very familiar with this. There is some dividend yield, you subtract the taxes that you pay. That's the capital gains term that comes through movements in the capital price and capital accumulation. And finally, there's this idiosyncratic risk. 
Uh, the return on outside equity is going to have some expected return that, again, is determined in equilibrium, plus the same idiosyncratic risk that is that sits in capital. So whenever you issue outside equity, outside equity you offload this risk one for one. And uh, finally, just just you know to to give you, to, to show you where this guy appears is going to be this uh, idiosyncratic volatility of the household. So if you look at the idiosyncratic volatility of their net worth, it's going to depend on how much portfolio they allocate towards capital. But then they can be subject to less risk in the end if they offload part of it, and that is determined by this guy. Yes. It's, it's the same as why this is the case in all the models that you have seen before, where the experts or intermediaries or however you call them hold something risky on their asset side and issue riskless deposits. The, maybe not a very satisfying, but I, I think the, the main answer to this question is that this is continuous time in which whenever you get this, you get these shocks continuously. All these shocks, they're not jump shocks. You get these shocks continuously. So if you see that, you might be in trouble and you might not be able to fulfill your promise to deliver uh, on the deposit that you have issued, you can always scale down. You can always delever and always be able to, to, to deliver the promise that you've made. With jumps, if you make this idiosyncratic jumps, it becomes a different story, same as if you make aggregate jumps. But, um, but this is not a feature of this model. It's, it's the feature of all the previous ones that you've seen as well. OK, so the intermediaries are going to be somewhat more involved. Um, they will also have log utility, same discount rate. And uh, their portfolio is going to be also more complicated. Um, and uh, maybe let me talk through it uh, starting from the back. So the way their, their net worth evolves, they consume, and then the return they get is going to be the excess, so, so, so I'm return on deposits, portfolio weight on outside equity times the excess return on that, portfolio weight on long-term bonds times the excess return on long-term bonds, and finally, portfolio weight on reserves times the excess return on reserves. But here, the return on reserves is going to depend on their portfolio weight on reserves. And that is because there is this reserve requirement and there's this threshold at which the interest rate on required reserves and excess reserves potentially changes. So in case the central bank char charges different interest rates, or it pays different interest rates on required and excess reserves, there's going to be the king in the average, in the, in the average return on these reserves. And that's why this return is going to be a function of it. So the, the intermediaries are going to understand that by putting more or less uh, funds into these reserves, they can change the return that they get. Uh, and uh, now these returns become that because of this kink, the returns become somewhat uh, less pleasant. But again, let's let's go through them one by one. Deposits are simple, uh, same as for households. Now, for reserves, you have this interest rate that depends on how much you allocate towards reserves, and then you basically have this term, which is think of like a capital gain, which is going to to be turned out just a minus inflation. So because this is a nominal asset, um, yeah, the real return is going to be decrease, decreasing in inflation. And now, how does this I, so let's try to unpack this function. How does it look like? Well, this difference here is how much excess reserves you're holding. So your actual reserve uh, weight minus the required one, that's how much of excess ones you have. Then you divide it by the total amount, you get the fraction of the excess reserves in total reserve holdings. And you multiply that fraction with the interest rate on excess reserves. And then this is 1 minus that fraction. So basically, the, the other part of your total reserve portfolio, you allocate towards required reserves, and you get this required uh, reserve interest rate. And basically, this is just weighted average between the two interest rates. If you don't hold any excess reserves, then you're only earning the required interest. 
Um, okay. Now, the long-term bonds, they're going to have some uh, yield, the dividend yield, which is the, the interest rate, the normal interest rate that you get on these long-term bonds divided by their price. PTL is going to be the price of these long-term bonds, the nominal price that, again, determined in equilibrium. And then we're going to have the capital gain uh, term um, in some sense where you're going to have inflation, but you will also have the drift of the long-term bond price. So we don't have that here because the price of reserves is nominal price is one. The nominal price of long-term bonds is going to be potentially changing over time. There could be some drift in it. And finally, when an intermediary holds an out some, some outside equity, they get the same uh, interest rate, expected interest rate that is paid by the households, but the risk exposure is going to be different for them because there's going to be this VARFI that uh, is going to decrease effectively the amount of idiosyncratic risk that they expose themselves to. Okay. Let's move on. Um, the government. That's the final part of the model setup that um, before we can talk a bit about the equilibrium. So this is the consolidated government budget constraint. On the left hand side you have um, in some sense the, the, the different sources of revenues for the government. And on the right hand side, you have the different sources of expenditures. So how can you earn as a government? You can issue reserves, you can issue long-term bonds, and you sell them at the price that is there endogenously, or you can raise taxes. How do you spend this money? Well, you have to pay the interest on required reserves, you have to pay the interest on excess reserves, and you have to pay the interest on, on bonds. And uh, as we said before, this is the nominal price of long-term bonds. Now let's introduce some notation that you have just seen in, in Sebastian's talk and probably, I think, partially in, in Marcus's talk uh, yesterday. We're going to have this nominal debt, the total nominal debt of the government denoted by B, the, this calligraphic B, that is going to consist of uh, reserves and long-term bonds. So before, if you think about Sebastian's model that he presented, there were only short-term bonds, which in this setup we call reserves, so it was B was equal to R, and they were identical. There was no long-term bond part. Now we just add this long-term bonds, and now the total value uh, has these two components. And uh, the real per capita value of nominal debt is going to be denoted, again as before, by this QTB, uh, which is the nominal value divided by the price level and by the amount of capital to preserve the, the invariability with respect to K. Uh, but in essence, that's the same object. It's the same QB that you have seen before. It's just now it has more things inside of it. And uh, the surplus to the ratio, again, same as in Sebastian's talk, the ST check. Uh, that is, you know, we're going to follow Sebastian in thinking about this being the most relevant and most important fiscal uh, policy instrument. And from now on, we will not be thinking about taxes, but we will be thinking about surplus to debt ratio and the fiscal side actually uh, managing this object. Um, now, how do we think about QE? Well, remember we said, let's have this psi variable, which is the ratio between long-term bonds and, and reserves that is there on the balance sheet of the intermediaries. It turns out that once you start solving this model and uh, you, know, you, you get to some equilibrium conditions, you get a slightly different version of this variable, which I denote here by var theta L T, which is not a ratio between long-term bonds and reserves in uh, quantities, but rather in, uh, in, in values. So what this var theta L measures is the nominal value of long-term bonds relative to the total nominal debt in the economy. And if you just look at this equation and you divide it through by R by reserves, you get here a psi, here you get a one, here you get another psi. So there's a one to one mapping between var theta L and this psi for a fixed uh, price of these nominal bonds. And it just turns out that uh, going forward, uh, this variable is much, much uh, more important than, than looking at, at psi alone. And uh, you can also see the, the analogy to this var theta that again Sebastian has just talked uh, uh, something like a half an hour ago. So this var theta was the, the share of all the nominal assets, the nominal debt in total net worth. Uh, so there was this QB over QB plus QK. And this var theta L is again a share, but in this 
case, it's a share of the long-term bonds within the nominal debt. So it's a share that is sitting within, within this share, if you, if you like. But they find it in a completely analogous way. OK, now uh, the last part that uh, goes back, I guess, uh, to your question. So why do we want to have this reserve requirements, two different interest rates, all of that? Why can't we not just go with one interest rate and uh, you know, no reserve requirements, for example? And uh, there are several answers to that question. So first of all, the way that, uh, let's say, you don't have to do it in this model, but we do it because we find it very convenient, is the following thing. We're going to set this reserve requirement such that in equilibrium, the intermediaries are going to hold the amount of reserves that is just above the required one. So they're constrained on the minimal reserve holding is going to be just not binding. What does it mean? It means that effectively in equilibrium, they're holding just an absolute amount of excess reserves. So once you look at the uh, government budget, this term basically drops out. There's going to be an epsilon there. Uh, so that is going to mean that if you move the interest rate on excess reserves, it's not going to affect your government budget constraint. So financially, from the perspective of the central bank, moving that interest rate, and well, from the perspective of the entire government, that would not have any consequences in this flow constraint. But on the other hand, because you're still subject to this epsilon of these excess reserves, that is going to be your marginal rate from the perspective of the intermediary. So effectively, what this allows is the central bank to control, to set the marginal rate, the nominal marginal rate in the economy completely independently of the average rate. Because the, the rate that the central bank will actually be paying on reserves is going to be this I lower bar, because the, the reserve required reserves are still going to be there. So if you move that rate, you have to finance it somehow, uh, if you, or you know, it can increase your, your spendings if you lower this rate. But not this one, because this is, even though this one is the marginal, because it just applies to this epsilon, it's going to be free for you. And uh, in some sense, this brings this model closer to uh, what you might be more used to, the, the standard New Keynesian model. If you think about the Gali textbook model, what they usually have there is uh, some short-term assets or short-term bonds on which you set the normal interest rate, but those bonds are in zero net supply. And that means that in that model, you can pick the normal interest rate completely freely without, in a sense, without thinking of any fiscal consequences or financial consequences, because the bonds are in zero net supply, so independent on how you move your interest rate, you never have to pay it. And in these models where we have these reserves that are not in uh, zero net supply, these interest rate movements can have fiscal and financial consequences, but what we do is effectively we, we put in the excess reserve asset that is going to be in the zero net supply. So this, these excess reserves are like the analog of just reserves in the standard new Keynesian model and allow the central bank here to set the marginal rate uh, with much more freedom. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So you, you cannot, and that's, well, that's going to be important once we go deeper, but from the flow budget, OK. Um, maybe I come back to this later to, to tell where exactly this is going to make a difference of whether you're cha charging the, whether they go hand in hand or not. But suppose you, if you take the long-term bonds out, then this question, I guess, disappears. But still, it's going to matter even with long-term bonds once we get to, to equations. OK, let me defer that. Yes. I'm going to get there. Um, OK, there, but probably next slide. Uh, uh, just, yes, another question. 
Exactly. So in this model, um, the excess reserve holdings are going to be zero. In reality, of course, they're not. This is a normative paper, and this is just a one way of achieving it. Now, going back actually to the question that was asked earlier of whether we really need to have this zero excess reserve set up where we manage the two reserves and balance these reserve requirements, we could think of a different setup in which we allow for interest rate, for we actually allow for excess reserves to, to exist, but then we manage the reserve requirement as a, you know, as a target. And then the size of these excess reserves becomes a, a, a policy variable. In this case, we fix the size of the excess reserves, and then we manage the interest rates. But we could do, at least that's our conjecture, that in, in the same way we could manage the size of excess reserves. Um, OK. So now, um, moving towards Jonathan's question about what, what, uh, what, is, what can move and what, what is decided. So the, I'm not going to kind of walk you through all the steps of solving this model, but I'm going to give you kind of a brief idea of what you're trying to solve for and what are the important objects in this model. Important objects in this model are going to be sigma tilde, so that's just the exogenous process for idiosyncratic volatility. Var theta, as before, the portfolio share that you allocate towards nominal uh, assets relative to, to uh, total to all of the assets. The nominal bond price and this wealth share of the intermediaries eta. So that's the same eta that I think you had in uh, Yuli's talk uh, yesterday. Now, the equilibrium we're going to be looking for is going to be Markovian with two state variables, this exogenous state variable sigma tilde and the endogenous uh, state variable eta. And the equilibrium is going to consist of laws of motion for the two state variables. The policy variables, S check, so the surplus to debt ratio, reserve requirement, uh, the two interest rates, and the QE policy that manages the long-term bond share uh, in the economy among the nominal assets, and these two mappings of var theta and uh, uh, bond price from the uh, state variables. And of course, the equilibrium is when you know, the, everything, the agents behave optimally and the market is clear. Now, what, coming back to your question, what, what is allowed to adjust, uh, what is not? In principle, in more generally, the idea is to pick all of these uh, policy tools subject to this constraint or a transformation of that constraint where you can see them more clearly. And then we have to decide, essentially, is it, let's say, the fiscal authority? You know, then we go into the question of you know, whether we have active monetary, active fiscal policy. In this talk, we will consider them jointly. So in a sense, there will be freedom of both reacting to each other. Um, and uh, I think that's, you cannot pick all five independently because you're bound by the consolidated government budget. So in that sense, Uh, I, if, let's say, if I were to say, suppose that the fiscal authority picks the S check in a certain way, and now I take a stand of the monetary authority and I ask myself, how should I pick the remaining, the, the policy variables that I control, such that I, on the one hand, respect the S check that the fiscal authority picked, and on the other hand, I try to maximize welfare. That's not exactly the exercise that we're going to be doing, we're going to consider everything jointly. So we will not be speaking about active fiscal, passive monetary, or, or any other combinations. But this is a joint budget constraint and basically a joint decision. We could consider versions of that. Actually, I think this framework allows to do that, but not today. <laughs> um, all right, but that's a very good question. I should have mentioned it. OK. Um, so let's. Briefly, again, just flying over how you would solve it. You would start by deriving the optimal choices of households and intermediaries. I like to do it with the stochastic maximum principle. I think you could just do a bit of a shortcut and do the Martingale method, same way that Yuli did. And uh, it's going to work. Maybe you have to, you have to think maybe a bit more carefully what to do with these reserves when the return depends on the portfolio share. But otherwise, uh, you're going to, to, to arrive at the same results. 
Now, once you have those, you combine them with the market clearing, and then you derive the risk allocation chi as a function, as a function of state variables. The money valuation equation for var theta, something that Sebastian showed you uh, just some time ago, the analog of that, the bond valuation equation for the bond price, and the law of motion for eta. And then if you want to produce some, some graphs and pictures and look how things uh, look, you can actually solve this model numerically. Uh, there are going to be two state variables, which is going to be slightly more challenging. But in this case, it will still be quite simple because there is no aggregate risk. And you only have two drift variables. And that, that turns out to be a rather easy problem to handle numerically. Um, and uh, what would you get if you, you know, do all the derivations? I'm going to be your RA in this case, and I'll do all of that for you. Uh, what you get is this risk allocation chi. Now, this must look familiar. That's the same expression that Yuli showed you yesterday, or you derived yourself yesterday, I should say. Um, but in that case, it was the capital allocation. That was because it was a model where the experts could hold capital. They were still better at handling the idiosyncratic risk than the households, but that was the capital allocation. In this model, the way we framed it, the way we wrote it, uh, intermediaries cannot hold capital physically, but they can hold it, um, let's say, indirectly through outside equity. And what matters is the risk allocation chi and not the capital allocation, because capital allocation is always is, cap is always zero in the sense that households hold all of it. Um, and then we have this money and long-term bond valuation equation. And uh, the way I write them is different to how you have just seen it in Sebastian's talk. Because what Sebastian did, he wrote an analogous uh, equation, but in an integral form. And the way I present it in a, is a, in a differential form. So this is the drift of this var theta. And here we have the same two terms that was in the Sebastian expression. So this one you recognize immediately, that's the S check. That was already in Sebastian's uh, expression, because that's you can think of it as a transfer from capital holders to bond holders, which, of course, increases the bond valuation relative to capital. And there's this other term, which uh, maps to idiosyncratic risk. The difference is that now we have this additional component that depends on var phi and eta, because the actual amount of idiosyncratic risk depends on how it is distributed between the two sectors and how much the intermediaries can diversify away. And then we get this new term that was not there, that is there just because we have these two different interest rates. And in that sense, I think it, it goes back to Sebastian's question, uh, why is it important and how does it uh, map to you know, fiscal consequences of conducting the interest rate? So if this were, if, if we charge, if the central bank charges, uh, sorry, promises, it doesn't charge, but promises the same interest rate on required and excess reserves, then this term disappears and then any interest rate movement can affect your portfolio choice if and only if it goes through these taxes. So if you raise the interest rate, you have, to, you have to finance it somehow, because you have these reserves in positive net supply. You have to finance it somehow. If you finance it through issuing more reserves, then it's basically a wash. You, you go to these reserve holders and you tell them, I'm going to pay you more interest, but I'm going to dilute your holdings faster. So that's not going to affect their real return. That's not going to affect the, the, the split of their portfolio between bonds and, and capital. But if you move taxes with that, then effectively you can change uh, the portfolio share. In this case, we can move this interest rate independently. But sorry, so if you, if you do it through this, this, this S check, then you basically go through the fiscal channel. Yes? Uh huh. Sorry if I misinterpreted your talk. Yeah, so maybe just to, to clarify it further, fix the future path of S check. So fix the future path of. Uh, surplus to debt ratios, then any interest rate movement will have to go through reserves issuance or, uh, you know, what is the other term, the issuance, or uh, I'm not sure how it's called. But it's otherwise, it, and if it goes through that channel, through, through this issuance, then it will have no effect. 
for it to have an effect, it needs to go through this fiscal channel. In this case, when we're able to control the marginal rate separately from the average, we can basically you know, twist the portfolio choice of the agents towards bonds or capital without having to go through the fiscal channel. And by that, I mean without having to move this S check. So once in this model, you fix this future path of surplus to debt ratios, you still have the freedom of uh, the monetary authority to affect, to twist portfolio in the way that you think is more desirable. Um, this is the, the, the bond valuation equation, which is much simpler because here the bond, this is the nominal bond and that, sorry, yes. Okay, uh, this, is, this basically is the martingale pricing condition when you price long-term bond relative to the deposit ratio. And the deposit ratio is going to carry this interest rate, which is going to be the marginal interest rate that the central bank pays on reserves because the intermediaries are going to price them the same. They're both risk-free. And so in the end, the, the, the marginal nominal interest rate that is going to matter for asset pricing is going to be this one, the excess one. And uh, um, basically the idea is, again, Sebastian already said earlier, you, if you raise these rates, you're going to lower uh, the nominal bond price because it's as if you discount the this interest rate payments at a higher rate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll try to answer your question. Yeah, I'll try to repeat your question and answer it at the okay. same time. So if I understand your setup correctly, what really matters in this model, in fact, if you allow for slightly more fiscal policy, as you said, if you allow for uh, taxing, for example, the wealth of intermediaries and uh, redistributing between intermediaries and households, you can drop the excess rate, the reserve requirement. That is, that is, is not the crucial part here. I think it's a nice thing, but it's not, it's not the crucial in, in what I'm going to show you next. Uh, what is crucial is that you're able, as, you, as Jonathan was saying, you're able to control the, the long-term bond price, effectively controlling the, the end of the yield curve. We, I guess the way I wrote it and the way I phrase it is you know, just uh, the, what, the reciprocal of what you're saying in terms of the yield curve. I, I communicated through the bond prices because, again, once we go and see how you should set these interest rates, what is going to matter is really the, the, the nominal bond price response, which is going to be linked to, to the long uh, end of the yield curve. So, I, if I, again, if I understood your setup, uh, if you frame it as let me control both ends of the yield curve, the long and the short, that will help me in you know, bringing, the monetary, bringing the economy closer to the efficient one. That is right. But for that, you also need to control not only the, the curve, but also the, the, the balance sheet size of the central bank. So the, the ratio between these bonds and reserves. So controlling the yield curve is not enough. It's just part of the story. The other part of the story is controlling the balance sheet composition of the intermediaries through conducting QE, through conducting, through expanding or, or shrinking the central bank balance sheet. Um, okay. Uh, the last equation of the equilibrium that we will talk about is this eta evolution. And again, you have seen, I believe, this with Yuli. Uh, that's the drift of eta. Uh, this, the term is that you're familiar with. So this is the 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 premium that the experts or the intermediaries in our setting earn because they're able to diversify 
risk away. We get some additional terms like uh, one minus uh, var theta because now we have this capital and bond and the new lease uh, model that was not there was no distinct that was not there was not uh, uh, a nominal bond asset. And then there's this additional term that again has the excess interest rate, the difference between the excess rate and the nominal rate, oh, sorry, and, the, and the, the required rate. Why is it there? Because remember, um, you, you show the intermediaries this marginal rate, the excess one, but you actually pay them only the required interest rate because of the way you set the reserve requirement. Effectively, you can tax them. That's, that acts as a tax or you know, a transfer if it goes the other way. So, this policy, this differentiating between excess and uh, required interest rates allows you to do two things. First, it allows you to steer the portfolio choice in the economy to, to channel funds from bonds to capital the other way around. And in addition, it allows you to redistribute wealth between the two sectors, between intermediaries and households. And that's why, as I said earlier, you can, if you don't like this, you can replace it with an additional tax. If you put a tax on intermediaries, you say, now you have to, put, have to pay 10% you know, of your uh, wealth uh, as a flow tax, and that's going to be redistributed to households. That's going to be equivalent. So that, that saves you one uh, fiscal instrument, in a sense, that you know, if, let's say, the fiscal authority now may be going a bit too much away, but thinking about a fiscal authority setting that path of taxes and committing to it and not willing to respect to, to respond uh, this gives the Montreal authority still the ability to steer the wealth distribution in the right way okay so uh, any questions so far so now that was the equilibrium now because we want to think about the the optimal policy so not you know how things work but how they should work we need to discuss what we exactly mean by optimal and, and efficient. What, what is it that we're trying to achieve? So for that, we have to set up a uh, planner's problem. We have to describe what are the outcomes that, that we can, uh, can achieve and which ones are desirable. So we're going to have a, pl a planner that is going to be constrained. So we will not let the planner uh, do too much because the, the more you let the planner do, the more instruments you need to put in the competitive equilibrium, the richer should your policy set be, and uh, uh, um, you know that that's going to push us into putting too many different taxes and and various other instruments and and diverting the attention from thinking about balance sheet policy. Uh, but the idea of the planner is going to be that the planner can freely redistribute wealth between the two sectors. So the planner can freely choose eta, but the planner cannot freely redistribute wealth within the sectors. So remember, there were these all idiosyncratic risk shocks, so the planner cannot, cannot diversify that idiosyncratic risk away. The planner is still subject to idiosyncratic risk, but the planner can choose how much the experts, how much the intermediaries hold uh, in terms of wealth, how much wealth is allocated to households. But within the sectors, there would still be these fluctuations because of idiosyncratic risk. And the other major constraint or important constraint is that the planner has to respect this equilibrium mapping of chi from eta. So essentially, this equation the planner has to respect. So the idea of this is that the planner cannot just come to intermediaries and tell them, you're going to be poor, you're going to have a low eta, but you will do all of the risk diversification. Of course, you could achieve that if you put in some other policy rules, but that's not what we're interested in. So that's why we just take this equilibrium mapping as given. All right. Um, that's the planner's problem. I will just briefly describe it. So the constraint efficient allocation is going to consist of uh, var theta as a function of the only exogenous state sigma tilde, eta the wealth share, and iota the investment rate that solves the following problem. So there's the planner who puts two, two, two weights, one minus lambda on uh, intermediaries, lambda, oh sorry, one minus lambda on households, lambda on intermediaries and tries to maximize this utilitarian welfare function. Um, what is the welfare function? Well, it's just discounted stream of consumption. What is consumption of, let's say, households? Well, it's the log utility that you apply to total consumption. So little c is a minus iota. When you multiply it by k, you get the total output in this economy. 
And then out of this, one minus eta is allocated to the household sector. And then each household, each individual household, has a, their own idiosyncratic wealth share because of precisely this idiosyncratic risk. So you can allocate eta freely between the two sectors. But within those sectors, individual consumption would still be risky and still be driven by this idiosyncratic risk. And so here are the constraints. Again, this one that, that we just talked about. And these are the, uh, the idiosyncratic risk volatilities of intermediaries. The 1 minus for theta, that's the portfolio share that goes into capital. And then you have chi over eta. I think you also derived this with Yuli yesterday. That's the idiosyncratic risk uh, volatility loading for the intermediaries. And that's the, the counterpart for the households. In fact, this problem might look kind of scary, but then it reduces to a static problem and can be solved state by state. So you just have uh, three first order conditions, and the solution to these three first order conditions, state by state, meaning for each sigma tilde, you have three unknowns and, and three equations, and you can, uh, you can figure it out. It's, not, it's, not, it's way simpler than, than it looks like. But uh, we're not going to solve it. We're just going to state it here, and then we're going to think of of uh, now this shock, and we're going to think of, we're going to see how the planet responds to the shock and how uh, the economy evolves. So suppose that we start in the steady state, um, and then at time t, there is an unanticipated shock that shifts our idiosyncratic risk to somewhere away from the steady state. And after that, we just drift back to the steady state using the law of motion. So if you have solved the model, uh, in the equilibrium model, globally, meaning that you did not just say, let me look at the steady state, but let me characterize it globally for, for different values of sigma tilde and different values of eta, which was not too complicated because those were only the drifts. Now, studying this shock is very easy. Because it's unanticipated, it's not going to affect the model solution because nobody expects this shock, so it's not going to go into any kind of uh, martingale pricing. It's not going to cause you any risk premium that the agents would like to have. And uh, you can just do this shock exposed. You solve the model without the shock. And then now that you have the global solution, you just need to figure out where you jump. And then you move back to the steady state uh, using your global solution. This is how the constraint efficient path is going to look like. So sigma tilde goes up. And what the planner says is that the value of bonds needs to go up because Bonds are, so just remember, this B is, is total bonds, both short-term reserves and the long-term bonds. Of course, the planner doesn't have any of that, but that's the variable that you can construct uh, exposed. So the value of the safe assets, of the nominal safe assets, should go up. Uh, and uh, the value of the risky, idiosyncratic capital should go down, because now the capital is more risky, so it makes sense that you, you should value it less. The portfolio should be twisted towards the safe assets, where theta goes up. Uh, the investment rate also goes up precisely because now we have this risky capital. We want to have a, maybe slightly less of it. And eta, so the wealth share of intermediaries goes up. And why does the wealth share of intermediaries go up? Because we are now in the situation when there's more idiosyncratic risk. So we would like to push more wealth towards intermediaries because then they can diversify more of it. So at the moment when there's more idiosyncratic risk, you value this diversification technology more. And that's why the planner is willing to allocate more wealth to the intermediaries. OK. Yeah. So I guess the question is, how does that solution depend on lambda, and how do I choose lambda? Um, what we're going to talk about later is not going to depend on this choice of lambda. In fact, you can even set the Pareto weight on the intermediaries to 0, uh, because even if you don't care about their consumption, you still care about them having some wealth so that they can do the, the diversification that is then valued by the household. But right, so that that's 
Exactly. So the lambdas for sure are going to affect these graphs quantitatively, but what we're going to say about the optimal policy is not going to be conditional on particular lambdas. So if you're interested in the quantitative uh, assessment, I'm not sure I could uh, tell you that for sure. If you put higher weight, let's say, on intermediaries, the planner in the steady state will allocate uh, higher eta. So in the steady state, the eta would go up just because you, 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 wanna have, you want them to have more consumption. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to affect this response because this is a response to the shock, which is not a lambda shock, but a sigma tilde shock. So I, I, it's easy to, to check. It's, you know, you have to run the code twice with two different lambdas, but I don't have the answer to that question. But again, qualitatively, with respect to the optimal policy, it's not going to make a difference, but quantitatively for sure. Okay. So now let's think how can we implement this. So what we want to do is that in our competitive equilibrium model, when the shock arrives and the sigma tilde jumps up, that we basically replicate this, that the economy behaves exactly the same way it does under the constraint efficient planner. Um, essentially, what we want to ensure is that on the impact, the economy jumps as in the efficient allocation. So sigma tilde suddenly moves. And we're going to have this sudden movement, the sudden jumps in all of our endogenous variables. And we want to ensure that when they jump, they jump to the right point. They, write, they jump as they do under the planner solution. And once they did that, we also want to ensure that along the transition path, they drift in the right way. So they have to start in the right position, and then they have to follow the right deterministic path going forward. So we, we're going to kind of decompose matching this uh, matching this jump here and the following transition path, because there are going to be different policy rules that will allow us to match one versus the other. All right, uh, and then uh, since, you know, if you look at the goods market clearing condition and you combine it with the Tobin skew with the pricing of capital, you can see that uh, once you know var theta, you know iota. So what you really care about in the end is just var theta and eta. Once you get for theta and eta jointly right, the ones they both follow the efficient path, the rest of the economy follows the efficient, efficient path as well. Okay, so let's, again, reiterate, uh, we want to do the transition path and the jump. We want to do them both right. Let's start with the transition path. So suppose that your initial jump was efficient. You jumped to the right point. Now the question is, how do you how do you guide the economy along this deterministic transition path going forward? So for simplicity, let's set this QE policy, this var theta L, to something constant. So in fact, whether you achieve uh, efficiency or not is not going to depend on this, uh, on the value that you set here, as long as it's not equal to 1, as long as you don't uh, go full QT. But uh, for simplicity, let's just const let's set it to 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 something constant. Then what we want to do is we have this drift of eta, and that's the equilibrium one, and we want to ensure that the eta at all points in time, at every point in time along this transition path, drifts exactly as it does under the planner solution. It has to be satisfied at every point in time. And then we have this, you know, once we have fixed this for L, we have this instrument, the differential between excess and required interest rate, that we can pick such that we ensure that the drift of eta always coincides with the drift of eta under the planner solution. So quantitatively, of course, I cannot tell you because all of this depends on what the efficient path is. But I know that as long as this var theta L is not 1, so as long as you have not done full QT and got rid of all reserves, you can find a path for this difference between effectively this tax on intermediaries that is going to implement the, the efficient, the, the optimal path of the wealth share between the two sectors. And once we have fixed that to ensure that eta drifts in the right way, uh, this is going to be fixed. So here's where the fiscal policy comes in. And then this S check can then guide your portfolio choice. So you have, think of two instruments. You, you pick one instrument to match the wealth distribution. Uh, dynamics, and you pick the other instrument to match uh, 
the portfolio choice dynamics. So going back to Jonathan's questions, uh, here the fiscal and the monetary authority do, do work hand in hand. So it's not that one is, is somehow fixed uh, exogenously, but they do respond to each other and they, they coordinate. Um, all right, so now, now suppose you know, we did the transition. The only thing that we have to do is to make sure that we jump right, that this initial impact response uh, coincides with, with the planners one. So how does this jump work? Well, once this sigma tilde goes up, capital becomes more risky. Everybody wants to move away from risky capital towards safe nominal assets. And that's going to push our theta up. And it's going to lead to appreciation of nominal assets and depreciation of risky capital. The intermediaries, they're effectively short in this nominal asset. So they have, in nominal assets, they have reserves, bonds, and deposits, but they're levered up. So they're exposed more to, uh, their, their liability side is more exposed to this nominal asset because they issue these safe uh, deposits, and, but on the asset side, they hold this risky capital. So when this, there's, this var theta increase happens, whereas this flight to safety towards nominal asset, it really hurts the intermediaries because they have uh, on net these nominal assets on the liability side, they're short in it and they're long in risky capital. So this channel is going to decrease the network share of the intermediaries. That's going to hurt them. The second channel is going to come through the effect on the long-term bonds. So remember, the uh, value of the long-term bonds, if you write it in this differential form, is, is this that we have seen before. But you can also write it in the integral form uh, like this. And then you can see that the today's value of the, the nominal value of the long-term bond depends on the entire future path of the marginal interest rate. And the marginal interest rate is this interest rate on the excess reserves. So depending on how you change this entire future path of marginal nominal interest rates, you can achieve any jump or any initial response of the long-term bond price. And this long-term bond price, if it, if it goes up, it's going to benefit the intermediaries because they're, they have it on the asset side. If it goes down, it can hurt them. So this channel here through var theta happens on its own just because you know, through this risk channel and flight to safety, but this channel is entirely controlled by the central bank. The central bank decides how much should this long-term bond appreciate or depreciate. And uh, again, I'm not going to, to, to explain you this formula, but this formula summarizes these two channels. Just if you work out the, the algebra, uh, this is what you're going to get. So this is the, the jump in eta. That's how much the wealth share of intermediaries responds on impact to this shock. And it depends on this jump of var theta, so this flight to safety channel. And it also depends on this J naught B. And the J naught B is a product of two things. So one is this long-term bond price response that is decided by the central bank policy on setting the marginal uh, interest rate. So rephrasing it and going again back to Jonathan's comment, this is like controlling the long-term end, uh, the long end of the yield curve. But the other thing is this var theta L, and that is your balance sheet policy. So why does it happen this way? Because this var theta L tells you what is the share that these long-term bonds have in the total uh, nominal asset portfolio that they hold on their, on, on their balance sheet. The larger it is, the stronger is going to be any price movement on these bonds. And if they don't hold any of those, if this is zero, then whatever happens to the bond price, because they're not holding it, it's not going to affect them. Now, what this means is, is that because, again, you have kind of, you're trying to match this one thing. You're trying to get this J not B right. And that's just one number that you're trying to get right. But here you have two instruments. You have this, the, the balance sheet policy, this for theta L. You control it by expanding or shrinking your central bank balance sheet. And you have another policy is just setting the, the path of the interest rate going forward once the shock has already arrived. And there are multiple solutions. So if you end up in a situation where your central bank balance sheet is small, so think about the pre-financial crisis balance sheet. The central bank balance sheet was very small. There were very few reserves. A lot of long-term bonds were held by the intermediaries. So this var theta L was very high. And that means that because this var theta L is high, you only need 
a small change in the bond price to achieve this J naught B whatever it is, a relatively small. So if you have a, a small central bank balance sheet, you, you need a, a less aggressive, a more modest, a more mild interest rate policy. You just need to change the bond price a little bit, and that's going to already push you towards the, the efficient response. Now, if you think about the large central bank balance sheet, so suppose you did a lot of QE, you had absorbed a lot of long-term bonds, you've taken them out of the economy, you have put in a, long, uh, a lot of reserves, your TTL is now low, but that means that to achieve the same target with a low TTL, you need a much more stronger response of these long-term bond prices. And that means that you have to move your marginal interest rates by way more. You have, to be, you have to conduct much more aggressive interest rate policy going forward from that moment, starting from that moment. So this gives you this trade-off, and this gives you this interaction between the size of the central bank balance sheet and uh, you know, the, the subsequent, what is important is that the subsequent path of the interest rate policy. What, what you, the QE that you had done previously affects how you should set the interest rates going forward. Yes? Uh, the, the, so the nominal rate on the long-term bond I keep fixed, that's a perpetual bond, you just you fix that interest rate once and forever. Uh, in principle, if you could, if you were sufficiently flexible in adjusting that one, you could have achieved the same. But in this case, I'm thinking about the central bank doing basically everything. Because the, the, the interest on the, on the uh, long-term bond, I think of it as being you know, the, the job of the fiscal authority. But in this case, it's enough. The monetary authority can, can do this on its own with the, with the two interests that it has. Yes? Five minutes, OK. <laughs> um, good. So I think we're done with, with the main part. So this is, was, was all flexible prices. Uh, oh, no, we're not done. Sorry, we have, I have pictures for you, of course. So uh, perfect. Uh, let's talk through the pictures. So remember, these first uh, six graphs we had in the planners uh, solution and then this was in blue and then I just add this red path that that results in equilibrium and the first exercise is that suppose that there is no response of this marginal interest rate or there are no long-term bonds these are equivalent so I either you know I, either this is set to zero or our TTL is set to zero in both cases this second channel going through long-term bonds is completely muted and the only channel you have is uh, this one through flight to safety. So if you, if you mute that uh, policy channel, what you end up with is that by, by picking the, this S check and by taxing the intermediaries, or no, it, it's enough to pick just the S check. By, by basically choosing the surplus to that ratio, you can steer everything right in the economy. So your are theta, iota, and the rest, except for eta. This, because in order to get the eta right, in order to get the wealth distribution right, you have to ensure that on impact you have the right redistribution of wealth. And what happens here is that, remember, the planner wanted the uh, intermediaries to become wealthier because this is the, the risk shock and we want them to diversify more of it. But what happens in equilibrium in this kind of suboptimal policy uh, situation is that because of this flight to safety, as we discussed, the intermediaries are actually hurt on impact. So they lose in terms of wealth, and you end up in a situation when the risk goes up, the intermediaries lose, and diversify even less of it. So this economy goes, goes in completely the opposite way. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes? Exactly, exactly. So, so just me to repeat it, what I do here, I replicate the planner's path in all the variables that I can. The only one that I cannot, conditional on shutting down this bond revaluation channel, is the path of eta. I can do the rest, but I cannot do that one. And uh, that one goes actually the opposite way because of this flight to safety motive. Now, if I do the, the optimal policy, if I, if I you know, I, pick the VAR TTL and the marginal interest rate response jointly in the right way, then I achieve everything. And then I have this flexibility that we discussed earlier that um, 
I have these two situations. So the red line is when I have low VAR TTL, which means that I did a lot of QE, so I, the large central bank balance sheet, and the high VAR TTL, which means the small central bank balance sheet. So think of the, the pre-financial crisis situation. So let's say we're in, in 2007 and we have a very high VAR TTL and small central bank balance sheet. When the shock arrives, we need a, a relatively small interest rate cut that's going to ensure a relatively small appreciation of long-term bonds. And because of this high VAR TTL, because of the high exposure of intermediaries to this risk, or not the risk, but to, to these fluctuations, is going to be enough to ensure that uh, the ETA jumps to the right point. So it's going to be enough to redistribute wealth in an efficient way towards intermediaries. But once we have done a lot of QT, we have expanded the central bank balance sheet, our TTL is now very low, so that we have to move the interest rate much more aggressively. We have to cut it, this red line, we have to cut it by much more. And we need a much stronger long-term bond appreciation, again, because we want to push the ETA to this right point. OK, so uh, I don't think I have any time left, right? Two minutes, OK. So I, I, I don't think I could communicate the sticky price uh, extension in a meaningful way in two minutes, and I don't want to go over time. Um, I just tell you that the way you would do it is you would take what Sebastian did with all the new Keynesian block, and you would just put it inside this model. So it's really kind of, you can build these models almost like you build Lego. You, you pick a block, and then you attach to it. And it's not easy to figure out how to build these blocks that they're easily attachable, but once you figure it out, attaching becomes easy. So if you do that, you're going to get this utilization. This another variable that you will have to match. And in the end, that is going to give you a trade-off between being able to stir the wealth distribution in the right way and stir this utilization and effectively the output in the right way. So in this flexible price economy, that was not a concern. And we had this multiplicity. And we can do a lot of things in different ways and achieve the constraint efficient allocation. But once we make prices sticky, the central bank or the, the, the government jointly has to decide. Do we value the output gap? Do we value the, the output path more? And we want to target that. Or do we value this risk diversification and financial intermediation more? And then we try to target that. So you will not be able to fix everything. All right, so I think I, I should conclude with that. Um, the, uh, I guess the, the main messages of, of this is that the balance sheet policy is the one that works as a mediator of the conventional interest rate policy. And the role of it is to set this balance sheet composition in the economy in the right way, such that when the shock arrives and the interest rates respond, you get the right impact response. You, you prepare the economy for the shock, and you don't try to, to use this balance sheet policy once the shock happened to navigate it. That's, that's uh, uh, the, the model tells that's the wrong way to think about it. The more QE had done previously, the more aggressively you should set your interest rates. Uh, and then under sticky prices, you have this trade-off that I could only very briefly mention. But uh, I think I should conclude now, and we have a break, and I'm happy to take questions during the break, unless we want to take them now, Marcus. Let's take the questions during the break. Thank you.